Hello and welcome back to my channel. In my last video, I finished up and fit the device that I built for Chris, the lineman who lost a good portion of his hand when he was electrocuted. Three months in and it seems to be working pretty good for him. You may have noticed my lack of videos lately. I had to take a step back from YouTube for a couple of reasons. First, I really haven't changed anything major on the device in quite a while. It's a pretty stable design and at this point it just needs to age through daily use so I can figure out where I need to focus my attention for future revisions. That being said, I really don't want to waste yours or my time filming and editing content that doesn't have any real value. The last thing YouTube needs is another channel like Winter Garden. Second, YouTube isn't paying anywhere near what it did during COVID. Continuous iteration and refinement on this project is expensive and I haven't received any real love from the algorithm for quite some time. A 10 minute video, by the time I write the script, shoot the video, do the rough edit, shoot the b-roll content, do a final edit and upload it, will take between 20 and 30 hours. For what, less than 100,000 views? That's not even $200. Or in that same time, I can be turning dials in my machine shop, making shop rate. So what have I been up to for the last three months? Side quests, a whole pile of side quests. A good portion of them stemmed from the recent implementation of the import tariffs on anything coming out of Asia. An example of the effects that the tariffs are having on what I'm trying to do can be seen in the last batch of parts that I ordered from PCBWay. My order ended up being taxed at 73%. That's equal to just shy of an additional $550 spread over eight components taking an $800 order and making it close to $1,400. That really changes just how far I can make grant money and Patreon funds go. The first side quest that I'll eventually make a video about is, I took a CNC lathe that I retired to the back shop about the same time that I got sick and retrofitted into a mill turn with two five station tool changers and a milling spindle. If everything goes as planned, this machine should help me more efficiently make some of the parts that I was having PCBWay make for me. The next thing I've been on and off again working on is experimenting using my 200 watt MOPA fiber laser to cut out the number 15 miniature roller chain side plates so I could make two by one leaf chain for the winder assembly. If I can manage to work all of the bugs out of this part of the project, it could allow me to decrease the overall height of the winder by nearly 3 16 of an inch. Sticking with missions to do with the winder, I've also been playing with the idea of keying the bottom plate of the winder to the upper mounting rail. By coming up with a way to join those two pieces together, one to another, without using hardware, I can change what I'm doing with the palm socket. The plan at this time involves adding a couple of all brown slots to the mounting rails and similarly a pair of mating stobs to the palm socket. And with this change, I could have the socket lock into the rails and with your residual limb inside the socket, the socket won't be able to compress and come out of the metal frame of the device. This would eliminate the need for mounting hardware to be embedded into the socket. This would also allow the socket to have a thinner cross section in the area of the interfaces with the mounting rails. Of course, that's only one part of what I've been working on related to the palm socket. If you remember way back how I used to make my sockets by impressioning my hand in alginate, casting that in plaster, and laying it up in a process similar to how you lay up carbon fiber, although instead of using carbon fiber, I was using cotton toddler socks as the mesh for the reinforcing layers. With that method, the plaster buck is generally considered to be a one-time use consumable. I had a couple of times where I've been able to get multiple poles out of a plaster buck, but that involves a pile of getting the timing just right and removing the plaster from the fiberglass while it's still green, but not too green. Lately, I've switched to using a scan to print method using the Creality Ferret Pro and Raptor 3D scanners. Loading the scan into Mesh Mixer or Blender, cleaning it up, refining the scan, and smoothing the edges, then loading it into the slicer of the day and printing the socket, in ABS to start, and PETG or TPU for the final. The problem that I run into with this new process is TPU doesn't thread or hold hardware for nothing. 
And PET-G, while it is safe for direct-to-skin contact, unless the model is absolutely perfect, it isn't super comfortable to wear all day. The rabbit hole that I'll be sharing in this video involves experimenting printing the sockets using an IDEX style machine, printing the distal end of the socket using PET-G, and the rest of the socket in 95A TPU. This video will be centered on my experience with a printer from a company that you've probably heard of, but never really thought of as a mainstream player in the 3D printer market. Snapmaker. You've probably seen their ads for their new tool changer style machine, the U1. It operates similar to how the Prusa XL does, where rather than extrude and retract through a single extruder, the gantry drops and picks up a different tool head in order to swap materials. I really do think this way of doing things is the future of multi-material printing. The way most of the multi-material printers currently available on the market operate is super wasteful. With an unload, load, and purge cycle every time the print calls for a change in color or material. Let me start out with the legal. Snapmaker isn't compensating me in any way for this video. I'm not part of any affiliate program with them. They don't get a first look at this video. These are my words. And truthfully, I don't even really need to make a video on this machine. But it is something kind of cool that you might not be aware of that is available in the marketplace right now. So, a little backstory. When I went to Rapid TCT in Detroit with Creality back in April, I met Blaine from Snapmaker. He was sharing a booth with the guy from iBoss. We started talking and he said that he really liked my project and that he would send me one of his printers. He ended up sending me one of his J1S IDEX style 3D printers along with a selection of hardened nozzles in 20, 40, 60, and 80. He did advise me that what I'm trying to produce with his machine wasn't likely to yield perfect results, primarily because of how different the two materials I'm using are. But he said try it out anyways and let him know how it goes. Before I get into that, let me tell you what is so different about the Snapmaker J1S. The J1S is an IDEX style machine, which means that it has two independent extruders mounted left and right on a common X-rail. The cool thing about an IDEX machine is that if you're doing a production run of a part, you can print two of the same part at the same time. Alternatively, if you're printing a part that you need a left and a right of, because the extruders are independently driven, you can set the machine up to print the reverse at the same time as it's printing the original. A real world case for this feature would be say you're printing a pair of orthotics. Print the left and get the right at the same time. Of course, using this mode does half the x-axis of the build platform. Another thing you can do is print two color models without any time or material being wasted with the unload, load, and purge cycle that you go through using one of the other multicolor machines currently on the market. This is how I'm interested in using this machine. Not using it to print with two different colors, but with two different materials. Normally, you'd have one of the extruders loaded with water-soluble PBA support material and the other loaded with the filament that you're using for your print. What I've been experimenting with is having the left extruder loaded with the 95A TPU and the right loaded with PETG. Filament-wise, these two materials are just about as far apart as you can get. Totally different temperatures, back pressures, and retract settings. So after a pile of failed prints, I figured out that by using the 060 nozzles and the slow settings for both materials, that I'm able to print the palm sockets pretty reliably. Something really cool about the front end on this machine is that you can adjust the temperature, speed, extrusion rate, and cooling for each of the extruders separately while the machine is printing. The front-end software for the J1S is custom to Snapmaker and unlike any Clipper clone that you've seen on every other machine out there. Think Apple versus Android. It really is that different. In fact, everything to do with this machine is more Apple than Android. The machine came mostly assembled. You do need to install the fan and shroud into the back of the machine and of course the display, but really that's about it. The machine itself has some things that I like and some things that I wish were different. 
one machine detail that immediately stood out to me from an engineering point of view and something that I've yet to see on any other machine has to do with the pulleys that the belt rides on. When the pulley is riding on the smooth side of the belt, it's appropriate for the pulley to be smooth. But when the timing belt is running on the tooth side of the belt, it really should ride on an idler sprocket. This tiny detail helps with belt tensioning, vibration, and the lifespan that you can expect from the belt itself. As a mechanical engineer, it is awesome to see attention to this kind of detail. Now, something super old school that I thought went away around the same time that Sailfish was cutting edge, and that is using glass for the print bed. I get it, glass is flat, and the new style of print bed stickers have come a long way since we were using Kapton tape and Aquanet to get the prints to stick. But a magnetic build plate is really what I wish I had seen here. Take the glass off the heat bed and you will see arguably one of the coolest things about this printer. It's comprised of three metal circles and a little square in the center of the heat bed, otherwise known as the automatic bed leveling index. This machine doesn't rely on a calculated mesh plane. And once you run it through the leveling and offset scripts, the extruders are truly level to the print bed. The best part about this process is that once you know how the process goes, you can run through both scripts in about five minutes and have it come out perfect. This just further emphasizes to me just how cool the automatic extruder alignment scripts are. On the J1S, there is no going back and forth calibrating the offset between the left and the right extruders. Simply run the script and it calibrates the offset perfectly the first time. As for slicing software, Snapmaker uses their own Lubin software. It's not my favorite. I prefer using something Orca or Bamboo based but Luban does have a nice paint feature that works pretty well for what I'm doing. Just be sure to save your work fairly often. So these days, printing is kind of printing. With that, this machine is not the fastest. It will not print you a sub 15 minute Benchy, but what it does offer, you can't get from the run of the mill machines. First, printing two of the same part at the same time, or printing left and right mirrors of a part simultaneously. And if you're tired of all the waste that you get from the purge cycle, printing multicolored prints, this machine prints two color without any waste. And my favorite, if you have a part that you need to print using two different materials, in my case, super flexy on the left and rigid on the right, this is the machine. Most, if not all AMS style machines out there right now, recommend against printing flexible filament using the AMS because how easily it clogs during the load, unload, and purge cycles. This machine doesn't have any of that. Once the filament is loaded into the extruder, it's there until it runs out or you switch to something else. Also, this machine has an enclosed, passively heated print chamber, which really helps with warping. If these examples sound like something that could help your workflow out, maybe take a look at the J1S. Or if you need more than two materials, maybe wait until the U1 comes out. Anyway, I've had pretty good luck with it so far with what I'm doing, and I like just how little waste you get from an IDEX style machine compared to an AMS CFS style machine. In my next video, I'll be sharing with you some of my failed attempts casting aluminum parts using Petrobond and a metal melter that was sent to me by Vivor. Let me know what you think in the comments section. Thanks for watching.